Hi everyone, my name's Daryl Payne, CEO of As Good As Gold Australia. And today, once again, I'm joined by my brother Brian and partner at As Good As Gold. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, and today we interview John Adams, Chief mm-hmm. Economist at As Good As Gold Australia. Good morning, John. Good morning, John. Good morning, Daryl Brian. John, the economy, I believe, is really starting to unravel now. Um, and it's, you know, there are comments coming from everywhere. Uh, Jamie Dimon, of course, we all know, CEO of JP Morgan, just recently, just a few days ago, suggested uh, they weren't heading or a storm wasn't heading in the direction of the United States economy, but a hurricane. He said, make no bones about this, a hurricane hurricane is heading this way. So we all know, of course, that uh, when America sneezes, we catch a cold. And so, what are we going to get after a hurricane? <laughs> well, that's right. Exactly. It's going to be worse than a hurricane. It, wow. Cor- correct. I mean, so this is really serious stuff. And uh, so what's happened in Australia just recently, of course, um, the RBA has raised for the second successive months interest rates 0.5 of 1%. So we're now up to 0.85 of 1%, which is historically still extremely low. But what I've noted, there seems to be an awful lot of panic out in the marketplace at the moment over this 0.5 of 1% adjustment. Mm. It's more than what they thought it would be. But as I said, historically still cash rate very low. I think it's brought about by the fact that the debt levels in Australia and the world at the moment are much higher than they have than they've been ever in my lifetime. Mm. And so True. debt is the concern uh, with as we continue to increase interest rates. John, your assessment, if you could, of the RBA's policy and the, and, and the impact that you believe it's going to have on our economy. So uh, Daryl, you are correct that this week was a very big announcement by the RBA. Uh, I mean, funny enough, on uh, Monday night, on Tuesday, I ran a, a poll on Twitter asking people what they thought the increase was going to be. And a lot of people thought it was only going to be 0.25%. So the fact that it's now a 0.5, which is the second decision in four weeks, and, and we've got the next decision coming up on the 5th of July, and we already have Westpac coming out uh, in the last 24 hours, suggesting that it will be another 0.5%. Uh, for a lot of households who borrowed to the hilt, um, the, that, that day of reckoning is, is going to come very quickly. So um, I've been a very big critic of um, the RBA and, the, and particularly the former government, the Morrison government's uh, response to COVID-19 with this extreme fiscal and monetary <coughs> policy. Uh, you know, that combined with mass propaganda convinced, uh, you know, tens of thousands of Australians to borrow ridiculous sums of money. Um, now, obviously, uh, at the Adelaide market is slightly different to, say, Sydney or Melbourne, but in Sydney and Melbourne, plenty of households borrowed more than a uh, million dollars to to get into the property market. So, in some cases, a million and a half, two million dollar mortgages. Um, uh, now, uh, last year, there there were a lot of people did take uh, f- uh, split loans, what they call it. So, a big proportion of it was fixed. Uh, but particularly in 2022, uh, because the variable interest rate was higher than the fixed interest rate, a lot of borrowers this year have borrowed um, in terms of variable interest, and now they're going to be caught short. And uh, you know, one of the things we were just discussing off uh, camera was the RBA's announcement uh, uh, through all throughout 2021, uh, um, and, and the governor said up until November that interest rates would not go up until 2024. Well, a whole host of Australians um, uh, took that on face value um, and committed themselves to a 30-year contract um, uh, to a mega mortgage. And now those chickens are coming home to roost. And so now we see uh, pain coming up. And, and just to give you a sense, so if someone borrowed a million dollars on a 25-year mortgage, uh, just these two decisions alone in um, in terms of uh, uh, May and, um, and in terms of June, uh, it's about $393 per month or uh, more than $4,700 uh, in terms of per year, in terms of the increase in repayments. So, so an extra five thousand dollars almost for um, people to to uh, in terms of uh, to pay a million dollar mortgage. I mean, for some households that that's already a stretch. 
and uh, we know that more rate rises are coming. And so um, uh, the, the, they, they left rates too low for too long. Uh, my view is they shouldn't have cut rates at all in 2020. Uh, but uh, but now we've got a raging inflation, official inflation at 5.1%, and we all know that the actual inflation in this country is way higher, uh, and they've manipulated the CPI by particularly taking land out of the um, uh, the in terms of their methodology in 1998. So so this uh, land price boom that we've seen over the last two decades has largely been absent from the CPI figure. And so, so that's why real inflation is running a lot hotter. But now that official inflation is running at 5.1, they can't hide the problem anymore. And uh, and then obviously the other uh, aspect is is that central banks around the world are aggressively raising rates, whether it's the US had half a percent or New Zealand or the UK. So Australia has now joined that uh, chorus. And um, the real question now becomes is, um, can they bring inflation under control? Um, and what will the impact on households be? I mean, one of the... Um, Fascinating things is that uh, uh, now in their um, uh, both in the minutes of the main meeting, but also in yesterday's uh, oh, sorry on Tuesday's statement, the RBA has consistently said uh, we don't know exactly what the impact on households will be. So 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 they're operating in a very black box. So they're going to say we're going to try to raise rates and try to bring inflation under control. Um, and they said on Tuesday that they believe inflation will return to 2% next year. Um, and again, I think that's a very foolish uh, statement for them to, to, to make such a definitive forecast. But their expectations is that inflation will return back to 2% in 2023. Um, um, but they're not sure what the impact on households will be. And there's a very big debate across the marketplace as to, well, what is the real position of households? We have... Um, Martin North with the digital finance analytics, he has a specific data set which says that mortgage stress is at 43% and a lot of households are really struggling um, in terms of meeting these repayments and all of their other uh, cash flow obligations. And then you have other people who pour cold water on that data set and saying that um, even um, there's a guy called Stephen Kokoulos, who's the um, former chief economist to Julie Gillard, he, he had the temerity on Twitter yesterday to say that household stress has never been lower, which is an outrageous statement. I don't even know how I could you know, make that statement as a professional economist. But there's there's all these uh, people who who have varying opinions about mm. are, are people okay. struggling with debt or not. Um, and it's going to be a very interesting decision in terms of uh, what what goes forward. But uh, now, the, in terms of, you know, um, whether the whether these policies will be successful or not. I mean, one of the things I will reference is is that if if anyone looks at the financial review this morning, they'll see that the former RBA governor Ian McFarlane uh, gave a speech yesterday in which he says that inflation won't go to two percent next year. It will probably stay at about three, four, five percent. Um, so inflation will stay high uh, compared to the RBA target. But he thinks that the cash rate will go to four percent. So we're at 0.85. He says it will, it will likely go to 4%, which means that mortgage rates will go to about 6.5%, 7%. And we have uh, tens of thousands of people who borrowed um, mega mortgages at 1.8, 1.9. So um, uh, so if you do the maths, um, at some point, uh, there'll be a, a bunch of households that are going to go belly up um, and, and their financial future has been destroyed by um, poor policies uh, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of what I would call poor and misleading statements by the RBA governor and mass media propaganda, and uh, I wanted, even though that as good as gold is a precious metal dealership, uh, I mean while I've been with you guys for the last few years, we've consistently warned people about the 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 dangers of having too much debt. And while we don't provide financial advice, we, we basically said it's always to be prudent and, and the three of us have no uh, you know personal debt in terms of mortgages and we've all set ourselves up and obviously both of you are a lot older than I am, but uh, right. sure. <laughs> but, uh, but, but no, I mean, I, mean, the, the, I mean, the great thing about the three of us is we were able to you know um, sail comfortably through uh, the pandemic because we, we had strong financial balance sheets in terms of our personal households and uh, and uh, but a lot of people don't now, and uh, it's going to be very interesting to see um, how bad the damage will be uh, right across the country. Yes, and uh, it's interesting on the varying. You mentioned varying opinions, and I, I agree with you a hundred percent. And this is confusing the Australian population at large. Mm -hmm. If you, I was watching a panel of uh, experts 
a few days ago, John, including a couple of economists. So this was on mainstream media, of course. And there was uh, a reference to all of the, the increase in costs that homeowners are now starting to experience. Mortgage is obviously number one, food, fuel, um, and um, j just energy, just all of the, uh, the costs that they are starting to experience. And the suggestion was that if this continued and interest rates continued to accelerate, then there was a likelihood that six months, 12 months down the track, the, uh, a new home buyer in particular that had overstretched themselves might be looking at an extra couple of thousand dollars a month in commitments overall, which they all agreed would be a very, very difficult task for them to overcome. Now, they spent 15 minutes on this subject and then said thank you very much and went to another segment. Guess who appeared on the next segment? The whole reference was to Al, Al, uh, Anthony Albanese's trip to Indonesia and with reference to Bali and that Bali was opening up and ships were at sea and now we needed more flights in the air to accommodate this huge, massive and growing demand for holidays in Bali. And you know, really, you need to book your flights now and get on because Bali's opened up and, and they've reduced their, uh, um, the, the issues they had at the airports uh, and now it's just a free flow, free movement straight through. And I thought, what's going on here? You've just spent 15 minutes telling me that the economy is in a very un unsound state, that people are now really have had their backs to the wall, that the cost of living has gone through the roof, and five minutes later, you open up and say, hey, let's go on a holiday. Let's spend more money. And, and I think, John, that Australia in particular has... We've had this issue for a very long time. It's still like it's, the, and it reminds me of the, not that I was in the Roaring Twenties, but it reminds me of what it, I believe it was like, that you've got certain segments of the, of the population that are still thinking, hey, spend up big. This couldn't happen to us. We're okay. And so in the end, it led to the Great Depression, of course, and everyone got hurt, except for the very few who were really set up well, had prepared really well, had lots of reserves, very small percentage of the population. Do you still, and John, do you still think that, that, that I, do you believe that I'm correct in my assumption there, that we're still sort of thinking this couldn't happen to us in Australia? Uh, we're the lucky country and we always will be. All I can say is that, I mean, well, I mean, that there, there, there probably is a big proportion of people out there who who still believe that. But for, I mean, I mean, uh, only in the last 24 hours, I've done a show with Martin North called um, "No Mercy for the Dead Sheep Sent to the Slaughter." And what I'm hearing anecdotally across the country is that people are starting to panic. So a lot of those people who said that could never happen to us, even though historically it has happened to us both in the 20th and the 19th century, um, I mean, those people are now coming to the realization that. Um, that that a nightmare scenario is coming their way, um, and that it's for, for a lot of them it's too late. And and the reason why it's too late, particularly when it comes to mortgages, is is that you sign a twenty five year to thirty year contract. Um, yep. and, and and for example, if you had a small debt, maybe you can uh, you know you know maneuver in a way that you can pay out that debt quite quickly um, and try to move on. But um, but but now that you've got this big mortgage, um, the only way to get yourself out of that. Is, is to sell the property um, or if you have multiple properties and, and we're already starting to see prices fall uh, quite in, in terms of quite heavily. So one thing I can say about where I live um, in Wollongong, just south of Sydney, is that um, uh, not like I mean, there's not a lot of traffic happening at the current market price. And privately, real estate agents are, are saying that if you want to get a sale, you've got to at least cut your price by 10 percent. 
and that was 10% before Tuesday. So we're recording on Thursday, uh, and two days ago, the RBA raised interest rates by half a percent. So now as we go forward in Wollongong, you probably have to cut your, your sales price by 15 to 20% just to get the sale. And we're only uh, four weeks away until the 5th of July when they're likely to raise interest rates another half a percent. So one of the um, interesting phenomena in the property market, Darren and Brian, is that as the RBA raises rates and they raise them quite by you know, substantial amounts in a very quick fashion, the psychology, the shift in the market and the shift in thinking is going to be quite dramatic and people will have and people will soon realize that they are stuck in a very awkward situation um, and they have to uh, they'll have to take losses. Um, and some of those losses, particularly when you're talking about property prices that are in high six figure, seven figure uh, levels, some of these losses are in the order of one to two hundred thousand dollars at least. So it's going to be very bad. And for those that need to liquidate their debt, um, the sooner they do it, the, 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 I mean, the sooner that they can minimize their loss. But if they try to hold on and, and think that they can get through and they can't, the losses are just going to build up between now and, say, October, November. You know, a blind person could have seen this coming. <clears throat> could have seen this coming. I mean, you're talking about an educated blind yeah. person. Yeah. Yes. You're talking about ridiculously low interest rates and easy money. It's a very bad combination if one provides this service over an extended period of time. You know, I look back to when I purchased my first home in 1980, John. I put down, it was a $150,000 property, and I put down $40,000 deposit. And now we've got home suppliers out there, Metricon, for, for example, in Australia, that are talking $3,000 deposit. This is 40 years later, John. 3000 I paid. I put down $40,000. they are talking $3,000 deposit today. I mean, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, the person who enters into that contract <clears throat> can't afford the house. It's as simple as that. So they're, they're doomed to fail. Mm. Uh, and we've got too many Australians out there in the same predicament. Yeah, can't say it any better. Yeah. John, before we go to the next question, I'll just make a comment myself. Um, Darren and I have always said, uh, we've listened to one person had a great quote, and he said, you will be in the same place 10 years from now, except for one thing, the books you read, the people you meet. And the people you meet, it comes up... Uh, whether you meet them personally or whether you listen to what they say, and you've got to be very careful about the about listening to the wrong person. I think we you made the comment, John, that six months ago the RBA governor said we will not see an interest rate move till mid twenty twenty four. All right, now we've had two in the last one month. Right, so lie. Um, now whether he knew or whether he didn't, you got to be very careful about the people you listen to. Right. Then he went and said a week ago, and I think John mentioned it again, inflation will be back between 2 and 3% by mid-2023. Complete lie again. It's 5.1, right? There's only one... 5.1 is what they're saying, but it's between 10 and 15%, right? Yep. So be very careful, clients, about who you listen to. The people you meet and the books you read, the people you meet has got to be educated in the right way. And getting to this education thing... Every economist, maybe not you, John, but every economist that I know of has been educated from 1971 to right now has been educated under the John Maynard Keynes system. And that system is borrow to get out of trouble. Unfortunately, John Maynard Keynes said it in reality for a short term. He didn't mind the gold. He didn't mind owning gold. What he didn't he didn't like the gold standard. And everybody picks up on this one. They say, "Oh, he didn't like gold." No, it's not. He didn't like gold. He did not like the gold standard as it was back in 1920, 25. Right. So he said, "Short term borrowing's fine," but our governments never borrow short term. They always borrow long term. And when you look at the economics of borrowing in a fiat currency, you never, ever, ever pay it back because you have to produce more dollars to pay the interest on what's all the dollars have been printed. So clients, be very, very careful about the books you read and the people you meet, more so about the people you meet. Going, going to the next question, John. In addition to the raising of interest rates, the RBA has announced its quantitative tightening program, which will commence this month. 
Can you explain what does this program entail and what impact will it have? One point I'll, I'll just raise, Brian, is, is that uh, I mean, in, t- in terms of transparency, I was trained in the Keynesian School of Economics. So, you know, I did some 40 years old now. I started learning economics when I was 16 in high school. Uh, we got taught when it came to macroeconomics, the basic principles of Keynesian economics. And then when I went to university, they, they brainwashed me with all that stuff. And and then I realized after I left university with my, with my $25,000 degree that uh, I, I fully didn't understand how the economy really works, because uh, most of these uh, Keynesian economists never uh, n- never could see that the global financial crisis uh, that it was coming, uh, and th- and then most of them did not predict it. So, um, I mean, after I finished university, I spent many years re-educating myself and learning exactly why Keynes was wrong, and and uh, trying to find economists who had different insights into how you know, how these debt bubbles and how monetary policy works. And uh, that's where I came across um, people like Ludwig von Mises in the Austrian school. So I was able to uh, re-educate myself and and, and and have a more richer understanding of how, you know, what are the basic principles of, the, of, of an economic system and a monetary uh, system as well. Um, and through that process, I think I've been able to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, come out with insights and forecasts that are more accurate compared to where I was probably, uh, you know, when I, when, I mean, in terms of where, where I was in terms of 15 years ago. So, so I'll yeah. say that's the point I make on that. Now, in terms of quantitative tightening, so um, what uh, our viewers need to understand is is that when the Morrison government and the RBA announced their uh, COVID-19 stimulus package, uh, when it came to uh, the monetary policy side, there was a number of things that the RBA did. So yes, they lowered the official interest rate or the cash rate to 0.1%, but then they uh, printed a whole bunch of money um, and they did a number of things with that. So they they lent, um, gave the commercial banks a very cheap loan. Uh, initially it was 0.25% and then it was 0.1%. And this is what they call the term funding facility. Uh, and they and they ended up giving $188 billion. So rather than the, um, the banks going to borrow this money from the wholesale market at more expensive interest rates, they got it at a very cheap interest rate, and then by uh, getting their funding costs at a cheap rate, they were able to, uh, to drive down the cost of capital and then give uh, lower mortgage uh, lower mortgage rates to their customers. And so this was all about driving bank costs down, so those uh, lower costs can be driven down to uh, to to uh, people who borrow money, whether it's business or or in terms of um, uh, households. But then they started to buy. A whole bunch of government bonds, both uh, federal government bonds, um, what they call Australian government securities or AGS, or but also state and territory bonds, and they bought them th- for three reasons. So from from March to May 2020, there was a lot of volatility in the bond market, a lot of concern that the um, someone was going to declare uh, that they were going to declare a bankruptcy or a default. So they bought a whole bunch of bonds initially to stabilize the market, or what they call uh, uh, like in terms of supporting the market function. Then they started doing yield curve control. So they initially started at the April 2023 bond, and then they moved on to the April 2024 bond, and they initially targeted uh, that bond at an interest rate of 0.25, and then they lowered it down to 0.1. So they basically wanted that the interest rate on that particular bond to stay at a particular level. And so they had to basically uh, be, you know, buy as many bonds so that the price will get us to a certain level in order to keep the interest rate, um, um, you know, down at point one. And so, why did they focus on that uh, on those sort of bonds? Because whereas in the U.S. system, the ten-year bond rate um, typically is a benchmark or reference rate for how interest rates across the economy are set. In the Australian market, it's usually the three-year government bond rate that 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 is usually our benchmark. So that's why they focus on that bond, and they got that down to initially to, to ultimately point one percent. And then they did quantitative easing. So quantitative easing is basically you you buy the bonds, but you're not focusing on a particular price point. You're just trying to buy the bonds across the maturity set, so from short-term bonds all the way through to 10, 50, 10 to 15-year bonds um, in order to in order to get all those interest rates down. But you're not targeting a certain level. So when you hear the RBA or a central bank saying we're going to get interest rates on a bond to a certain number, that's yield curve control. If they if you hear them say we're just going to buy bonds to generally have a downward effect on interest rates across the board, that's quantitative easing. But when you put all that together, 
we're, we're talking uh, in the order of about uh, 250 to 300 billion dollars that they that they printed out of nothing and bought all these bonds. And 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 so what that has done is they've expanded the balance sheet of the RBA. And so all of these bonds are now on there. Now, uh, quantitative tightening is a, it's a, basically what they're trying to say is we're going to reverse this process and we're going to try to restore the health of the balance sheet of the RBA. Now, the only t- the only way you can make this work is uh, during World War II, the United States did quantitative easing. Um, um, and they printed money out of nothing, even though it was on the gold standard, they printed quite a bit of money um, and, and they basically drove um, uh, interest rates on the government bonds very low so that the American government could spend more money um, in order to fire both the Germans and, and in terms of the Japanese. Now, once World War II was over, um, the Congress, particularly in the late 1940s through, through to the early 1960s, they ran very large budget surpluses. So they basically dramatically cut spending they did cut taxes but by, by a low level, and they had these surpluses. And so with these surpluses, they bought the bonds back from the central bank, and they were able to shrink the balance sheet um, um, in a responsible way. Since the global financial crisis, the reason why quantitative tightening doesn't work is because uh, whether it's, say, the, the Japanese or the US government or the European Union, all of these governments continue to run in terms of these budget deficits. So if you say to the market, we're going to shrink our balance sheet by, by for, for example, in this term funding facility, about $83 billion has to be paid back by the banks next year, and then the rest of it has to be paid in 2024. And then in terms of these government bonds, basically there's about $4 billion that will mature this year, and then next year it's in the order of about I think 45 billion, um, and then and then as we go forward, it's between 35 to 45 billion per year. And supposedly these bonds are supposed to roll off the balance sheet. And if they do in the way that the RBA suggested, is you know what's that going to do? Is it's going to mean that the supply of bonds in the secondary market increase, and, and obviously with more bonds, um, that that pushes the price of the bonds down and pushes the interest rate on the bonds up. So, so, so the whole net effect of that is if we have the RBA raising rates uh, in terms of these short-term interest rates and they do quantitative tightening, which is going to increase the cost of capital in terms of these long-term rates, it's going to just add more pressure on the financial system in terms of the banks, in terms of the cost of capital. And, and, and you're going to see banks push up interest rates on their products uh, beyond what the RBA does in terms of its, in terms of its official interest rates. So the reason why I'm very skeptical that, that, that they can implement this program effectively is one, um, if you want to do quantitative tightening in a sustainable way, you need Canberra to run a budget surplus and use those surpluses to buy back the bonds so that you don't increase the supply of um, supply of bonds and drive up the interest rates. But obviously, um, the, the ultimate question here is, is that we are on a path. Um, so if, if, if the RBA continues to raise rates, and there's obviously a big question as to how high they can raise them, if it's 2%, 2.5%, 3 4%, and on top of that, you do quantitative tightening, I mean, you could see mortgage rates of 75 8 9%. And, and in that situation, it's going to be very much like the Irish housing crisis. So we are on track at the moment to, to, to see what happened in Ireland, which is ultimately very much like the Harry Dent deflation scenario, where basically um, too many people default on their mortgage, um, um, the housing market crashes, the economy crashes, and then the, and, and then the banks go bust. So, so now, uh, if we if we do what the politicians and the bureaucrats are telling us they're going to do, that's where we're ultimately going. But but obviously, uh, in terms of our the next question we're going to talk about, uh, my, my thesis, which I've been rolling out over the last month or so, is um, they don't want Harry Dent to be correct. They don't want the deflationary crash. So so that's why I suspect they're going to raise rates. They're going to pause, uh, and then they're going to start cutting again. And 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 by cutting, they're going to try, try to, uh, to 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 keep life in the bubble going. And, and and the big question is that no one really has an understanding of is um, how high can well how committed is the RBA to raising rates and really uh, implementing this um, quantitative tightening program, but also how much additional cost can households absorb before they start to default on their mortgages? Um, and because we um. Because there's some uncertainty 
about those questions from a mathematical point of view. Um, I mean, you know, I mean, the banks are. Uh, I think the RBA said that they're the data dependent, so they're going to implement this program and then quickly uh, try to assess, you know, the impact. Um, and, and now some people think that they have some time before the situation gets out of hand. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm perhaps more of a pessimist. I think that. Uh, probably in the next six months, you start to see blood on the streets in terms of some of these, what they call the marginal borrow, these new borrowers that have basically borrowed huge, uh, you know, 800 to $1 million mortgages on variable interest. I think they will go, uh, you know, they'll be forced to sell within six months. Um, and it'll be very interesting to see exactly how that plays out. Incredible, incredible. You know, John, with all the facts and figures that you just put through, that's why we, you know, we have a contract with you to advise us on economic conditions and things like that. But Daryl, I have talked about it for so many times before, but that's why I love the gold standard. Mm. None of this borrowing, you either got it or you haven't got it, right? If you haven't got it, you do not spend. If you have got it, you do spend. And it goes from one country to the next country, to the next country. If you pay in gold, there is no debt. Right? It might be tight for certain short periods of time. I will not deny that. But if you've got gold, you pay for it. But all these loans and, and uh, going into bonds and all this sort of stuff, in today's economic climate, I, I just see a complete mess out there. And I have to agree with John. You know, very short term, we're going to have a, a very complete mess. Darren? Well, uh, when you say short term, yeah, I think we've absolutely, but uh, I see this continuing for a long, long time. Should we go back to a this gold standard? Go, this, is, this isn't going to be overcome like the 2008, 2011 no, no. GFC. Um, the real estate brought about that downfall, the, the, the excessive, excessive spending there mm. and, and the corruption there, mm. but... This is bigger than that. I mean, this is this is on a global scale. I mean, John's been talking about this for the last few years. We've been interviewing people that have been, we've been talking about this subject in depth for the last few years, warning people. And uh, John's been right. He, is, he hasn't really put a foot wrong. No, right? no, not So, at all. you know, you, you said before, it's people you meet in the books you read. It's, it's people like John Adams that you've got to listen to. I mean, they're qualified. They're, they're not being paid off on main, mainstream media, mm. right? They're telling you how it is. And uh, hopefully people listen. Yeah. John, with all of this, this debacle that we're confronted with, I mean, ultimately, do you believe that the RBA are going to be successful in in overcoming inflation? Uh, I mean, and if they're not, and if they're not, why not? The ultimate way that the RBA, but also central banks around the world can, can successfully um, uh, beat inflation is they've got to pop the bubble. So, so, so we, we have to accept a depression. We have to raise interest rates that basically result in the banks going bust and we can reorganize the banks on a more sustainable basis. We have to accept that in, unemployment could go north of 30%. We have to accept that governments have to splash spending and so a lot of the things that we take for granted, whether it's uh, uh, Social Security or the NDIS, uh, the National Disability Insurance Scheme, or all of these pot potential handouts, um, you know, uh, education, uh, Medicare, et cetera, a lot of this has to be curtailed if you're going to get spending under control. Um, and, and so just to give you a sense, uh, with the budget that was announced by Josh Frydenberg in March, he announced a budget deficit of $74 billion, and he said that was prudent. Um, now, $74 billion debt, uh, when, when we're supposed to have record, uh, when we're supposed to have strong economic growth and record low unemployment, uh, I mean, um, that, 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 that is a huge problem. I mean, typically when you have this robust economy, you should be running a budget surplus, um, and then when times are bad, that's when you run the budget deficit and you basically try to use government spending to to even out the, in terms of the peaks and the troughs. I mean, that's actually what John Maynard Keynes actually said. He said, when times are good, run a surplus um, uh, and pay down debt. And then when times are bad, run a deficit and then try to use government spending to keep people in work. Well, well, we supposedly have a robust economy. And the best Canberra can do is, is a budget deficit of $74 billion. Now, we have... Um, the new treasurer, uh, Jim Chalmers, 
uh, announcing that he'll deliver his own budget in October. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see exactly what he will announce. But I mean, Labor went to the election ca- um, election campaign with uh, additional spending commitments more than the coalition by about seven point four billion dollars. But Labor is 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 now signalling that that there won't be a cost of living um, a, a package uh, in October and that there'll be some significant pain uh, that has to be felt. But is Labor going to balance the books? Um, uh, I don't think that they will. Maybe they'll cut spending to a certain degree, but we're still going to be running it in terms of budget deficits. So um, so the reality is, is that neither the household individual or corporate Australia or politicians want to do what must be done to get inflation under control. So, so uh, I mean, the only solution is a full and deflationary depression. So the Harry Dent scenario is the the ultimate solution. And because they all say that it's the cost of that, both politically, economically, socially, um, um, spiritually, et cetera, is too great for Australians to handle, that's why we're still going to have an ongoing inflation problem. And, and obviously, as I said before, uh, only yesterday did the former RBA governor in McFarland say that he thinks that inflation next year could be at 5% with interest rates of 4% and that we'll have to just live with 4 or 5% inflation and we, we won't be able to go back to 2 or 3%. Um, and and, and because, because we can't get interest rates high enough. Um, so so, so, so one, one, one key aspect of this uh, is that, for example, any time that you've wanted to get inflation under control, typically you put the cash rate above what the inflation rate is. So, I mean, when inflation in, say, the US in the 1970s was running at around um, in terms of uh, 15% or 14 15%, uh, Paul Volcker raised uh, interest rates to 18 to 20% to get inflation under control. Well, um, I mean, if inflation is 5% now, um, Ian McFarlane says that inflation could peak in Australia at 8%. Well, we would have to take the official cash rate not at 0.85. We'd have to take it at, at about <laughs> 9 to 10% to have a chance of getting inflation under control. And that will basically um, result in you know the full collapse of the property market and the banks will go bust. And uh, and then obviously the banks go bust, we have a depression uh, like we did in 1892. We, um, and, and, and again, I think we've made this point numerous times before. A lot of Australians think that the Great Depression in 1931 was the worst depression in Australian history. No, 1892, 1893, when the banks went bust in Melbourne, that it, that's the most um, horrendous uh, period in, in, the his, in, the, in the economic history of Australia. And I mean that's the cost we have to pay if we want to get on top of inflation. So because society and the in the elite don't want to pay that cost, that's why I'm very again bullish about precious metals because I think precious metals just like in the 1970s perform extremely well in a stagflationary environment. And I think we um have you know started stagflation started in in 2020, and I think stagflation is going to intensify over the next couple of years. I think it's going to take a bit of a breather in the next uh, six months. But then I think that as we go into next year and 2024, once the central banks, uh, you know, pause their rating tight program and, and start to cut again, that's when we're going to start to see a huge inflow of capital into commodities and uh, and basically commodities will, will rally, which typically happens in runaway inflationary environments. Mm. Is, is, isn't it interesting? Um, Going back, how the look, it gets down to our Labor government not really having an effective policy, as I read it. When we were leading into the election, all I heard from the Labor government was, um, we'll do this, we'll do that. They, they highlighted their policies to some degree and how they would get Australia back on its feet. I never, ever heard the word inherited once. And now I'm hearing it all of the time. So we inherited this really bad economic state that we're we're in right now. And but and so it's going to be a long haul to get Australia back on its feet again. And I know it's going to happen. They're going to say in, in th- three years' time or leading up to the next election, they're going to say, hey, look, we inherited this position, right? And we've just about got it right. But you'll need to give us 
Another term. Another term. You've got to give us another term, and we'll get we'll get on top of this. It's interesting how the, how it all changes, though. You know, the, their their presentation changes once they are in mm. government, <clears throat> yeah. but they really don't have an effective policy at all. No. It's all about winning votes, yes. right? Yep. And and then blaming the opposition for the position they're in. Yep. And gaining another three years so they can have a a, a good handout when they want to retire. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. yeah. So I think Brian. Once again, times of incredible uncertainty, governments that really don't have answers to the position, the economic position we're in right now, uh, more than ever mm. in history or in my lifetime, uh, there's a need to own gold. Um, when all else fails, you go to gold. Yeah. Um, look, you've just made a point there that um, in history, um, so you look at the history and say, okay, yeah, they dealt with this question here and or that that particular problem there. But we have got so much debt, so much debt mm. has been accumulated because mm. of uh, because of fiat currency. Um, this is this is totally different. They don't know how the governments do not know how to handle all this, and um, there are difficult times ahead. Now, Peter Daniels, um, um, our lifetime mentor, of course, um, said in these economic times, you need reserves more than ever before yeah. you need gold and the these families set up dynasties don't they i mean we know graham his son we know peter daniels jr his son and these they've followed the same traits as dad has they've stored gold they've invested in gold over many years their children invest in gold every right. quarter every yeah. quarter might be every month yeah. but every quarter a percentage of their income goes into solid investment, which is gold and silver. Can't, can't be taken away from you. Yeah, John, what are your thoughts there? The, the previous com the, the previous question that we were just uh, asking and answering, Daryl, was about will, will the governments uh, of Australia, but also governments around the world and central banks, will they win the fight against inflation? And so mm -hmm. my view is because they won't. Um, we're going to have ongoing stagflation going forward. Um, and, and, and the best protection, and we know this from the history of the 1970s, the yep. best protection um, is to have precious metals. Uh, and, and, and I would say, again, we're not financial advice, but I'm just advocating in terms of what I've done with, with in terms of my own personal finances. I've, I've heavily weighted uh, a big portion of my portfolio in precious metals because it just... Uh, I mean, I mean, history would say that uh, when, and again, like I think, I think the key point, Darren Bryant, to to say to our customers is, is that the market as a whole hasn't really woken up to the fact that that uh, inflation is a problem that's going to be with us for for quite a for quite a while. I mean, we've just been talking about in this conversation that a lot of Australian investors, a lot of Australian households, are just waking to waking up to the fact that there's too much debt. And now they've got a problem in terms of interest rates. Well, once the central banks pause and pivot and start to cut again, um, probably next year going to 2024, and that we have high inflation, people are going to wake up to the fact that um, that the government can't win the fight against inflation. Um, and once uh, once uh, institutional investors, but also retail investors, wake up to that to that fact um, across the across the world, but in particularly across Australia, that's when you're going to start to see. A lot of uh, panic about inflation. A lot of people rush into gold and silver, um, and and obviously the whole thesis of, of of the whole basis of investing is to buy low, sell high. So um, so 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 we've seen a bit of a dip in uh, in the gold and silver over the last uh, few weeks as uh, there's been a rush into the US dollar. But uh, but I think that uh, once we see this pivot, uh, and once people realise that central banks and governments are not serious about fighting inflation, and they're not willing to do what is necessary to win the fight, and and again. To win the fight in Australia, it's uh, it's at least you know interest rates north of ten percent, mm. which would kill the housing market and kill the banks. And because yeah. they're not willing to do that, um, once people realise that that resolve is not there, and we're going to lose the fight to inflation in in the, in the next few years at least uh, before we wake up to our senses, uh, you're going to see a massive rush into gold and silver across the market. Um, and, and that's when I suspect we're going to see a huge rally in terms of prices. So, so I think this is, uh, and again, so I think people should be allocating capital based on the, the economic circumstances before us. And so we have a situation of record debt around the world. We have, we have central banks 
supposedly trying to get inflation under control, but we know they're not going to do what is necessary to win that fight, and they're going to surrender to inflation. Um, and when inflation starts to rage even further out of control in the next in the years to come, um, uh, if you do have precious metals, you'll be able to weather the storm, um, and you'll be able to maintain your purchasing power, and you'll be able to live a life that you have been living over the last few years, whereas those that don't have, don't have precious metals, it's going to be a nightmare scenario. And uh, I mean, you, you know, both of you have read history books about hyperinflation and runaway inflation. I've read those books. Sure have. Um, uh, you know, I've read a lot about what happened in Germany in 1923. So, so for the average middle class family that, uh, particularly, uh, you know, the, they rely on their wages, and wages doesn't keep up with prices. Um, uh, you know, those p people suffer, you know, huge falls in standards in their standard of living. And um, precious metals can give you that avenue that you can protect your you, that you can protect your wealth, but also protect your standard of living. And and, and that's what as good as gold is all about. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I, I look back, Brian, when we got serious. Uh, investing in precious metals, uh, and our portfolio now from the, from from around 2000, it's up 650 percent. That's our gold investment, yeah. and silver up around 500 percent. We've always said, haven't we? Gold and silver, even though you could get rich quick, it's not why you invest in no. precious metals. No. No. But you will get rich slow. Yep. Oh, uh, look, absolutely. Yeah. With all the protection around you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You've, you've got, you're not reliant upon the banking system. And Jim Sinclair, of course, mm -hmm. refers to that all the time, become your own central bank. Uh, and Peter Daniels has done exactly that. I believe we've, I believe John has done exactly that. Um, so why do central, I mean, isn't it interesting with central banks and governments, they do not want us to own gold. Why don't they want us to own gold? Because it clearly demonstrates how poorly they have mismanaged the economy. Yeah. I mean, you've had gold at $35 an ounce back in 1971, and, and now it's over 2500 And you'd say, well, okay, so currency, which they have been in control of, has lost its value when measured against gold by 97%. Mm. So clearly, the lower price, the, the lower price that gold's at the better it looks for a government. Yeah. They hate us owning gold and having any understanding of it at all. Is yeah, that correct? Quite correct. And I mean, we show a, a silver coin at a dollar back in the, the at the time of the Federal Reserve, and now it's a thirty-three dollars spot. So that's three thousand three hundred percent increase, right? But silver, like gold, has lost ninety-seven percent. Oh, sorry, not sorry, the dollar has lost ninety-seven percent of its value. Yeah. So, what is the better money? Oh, absolutely. One goes down in value, the other one goes up in value. It's a clear case, isn't yeah. it, for purchasing gold? Yeah. Egon von Graes, just just in closing, our really good buddy away over there in Switzerland, I'm constantly being asked the question, how much should I invest in precious metals? And I'll never forget the day that he walked out on stage after <laughs> the CEO of the Perth Mint. Who said? Oh, who said? Yes, some yes, people, yes. some people. Of course, he said, I, I recommend five percent in gold. But he said there are some people out there that invest fifty percent of, uh, of their their total assets in gold. Uh, and he said, but they're on another. They're living on another planet. <laughs> then Egon von Greyers, of course, walked out, the <laughs> keynote speaker at the event, and said, "Hi, my name's uh, my name's Egon von Greyers, and I come from another, another planet." planet. <laughs> right. And. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they loved oh, it, didn't they? They loved it. We really went down loved well. It. You know, first of all, let me state that I live on a different planet. Because Richard just told me that. I don't know if you remember. Anyone who says that you should have more than 5 or 10% gold lives on a different planet. So that's me. Because if you only have 5 or 10% gold, you're going to lose a lot of money in the coming years. A lot of money. Yeah. But what does he say about how much yeah. you should invest in gold, Brian? You know, how much should you invest, you know, and, and, and how often should you invest? Basically, whatever you cannot afford to lose, right? If you've got, you know, a, a bank account out there and you feel that inflation is going to take, you know, rip into it, look, puts a lot of that into precious metals because that's what you cannot afford to lose is how much gold and silver yeah. you should have. Yep, absolutely. John, 
Thank you so much for your input today. As always, it's uh, been a great ride with you and uh, we're looking forward to it continuing for many years. Really appreciate your input, John. You're, I've said it before a million times, but you're beautifully researched. We love your information and your input. Thank you so much again, John. Um, and to our viewers and subscribers, thank you so much for supporting this channel on an ongoing basis. So until next time, stay well. Stay focused. Goodbye for now. Goodbye for now.